everybody to the first uh, CITP invited lecture for the spring semester. We have, uh, as you'll see, a busy calendar. Um, we have um, uh, next week, uh, same time and place, we have a lecture by uh, Amar Vide from uh, Columbia Business School uh, entitled The Ventures in the Economy uh, about why the U.S. economy has done so well at uh, high-tech innovation. Uh, and uh, just as a preview, he argues it's not because of our awesome techniques. Uh, but this week, uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Steve Schultz and Chubam Mukherjee from the Berkman Center at, at Harvard. Um, they have done uh, some really interesting work looking at uh, the availability of, um, of um, records of federal court proceedings online, or lack thereof. Uh, and I understand they're going to give us a tag team talk. Yes, that's right. Well, thanks so much. Uh, we're both delighted to be here. Um, uh, as I understand, there is, uh, at this hour even, an exciting announcement uh, coming out from the ACM US public policy team talking about government transparency and government documents. Um, and also, as Shubham and I started to work on this, we uh, were inspired in part by uh, the paper that a few of you here uh, had been working on, and uh, as I understand, it will be published in the um, is it in the uh, Yale Jolt Yale, Yale. Journal of Law and Technology um, uh, about government transparency? And we'll mention that a little bit going forward. Uh, I'm a fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Uh, and Shubham has, uh, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but Shubham is or is soon to be a lawyer. He's a third year law student uh, and has helped inform uh, the legal side of our analysis as well. Uh, so today what we're going to talk about is um, uh, the nature of the systems and the policies around those systems for giving the public access to the public record, specifically the public record in the case of the federal court system. Um, and uh, as, you can, as you'll see, there are some very specific technical instantiations uh, that flow from assumptions that the court has made about who they're serving uh, and how they should be served. Uh, but we'll start off with a couple of snapshots. Uh, at the lunch today, there were a few folks actually discussing this on the way into the lunch. Um, these are a few snapshots of web coverage of the Franken Coleman trial, which is ongoing in Minnesota State Court right now. On the left hand side, you see a uh, live chat, which is on a website called theuptake.org, very interesting citizen journalism site, which has been covering uh, gavel to gavel, live video, chat, and otherwise coverage of the proceedings. The video on the top right is the live video that they're streaming to the web along with their analysis after the fact. Uh, and you can't quite read the tiny conversation in the chat, but it's actually quite fascinating as the proceedings go along. Someone's asking a question about a particular argument and how that affects standing. Someone else is, uh, is asking about um, uh, different decisions and how it affects uh, attorney's fees and who has to pay those, as well as a whole lot of other banter, as you might expect. Um, and along the way, they post the documents and other events that happen. In the bottom right-hand corner is part, a partial snapshot from the actual Minnesota court site, where in real time or near real time, they're updating uh, with PDFs of the latest documents as they're filed. And of course, people in the chat are linking to those and talking about whether or not particular arguments have merit. The other snapshot is this form. This form is the form that you need to fill out if you want to get access to the case documents uh, for a case uh, from the National Archives. Now, these documents are typically for cases that are 20 years old or older um, because they've been uh, at the courts for a while and eventually they ship them off to the archive. And if you wanted to obtain those documents, you would uh, first of all have to decide um, how exactly you want your case. Do you want to have the documents certified or not? Uh, if not certified, then you have a total cost of $70. If so, you have a total cost of $85. God forbid you want four or five cases. The, the charges can rack up fairly quickly. Um, and then in order to actually request them, you have to know uh, the uh, court location, which perhaps you would know, the case number, the um, case name, the transfer number, the number that the court assigned when they transferred it from the court to the National Archives, the box number in which the National Archives is storing the case, and the location number within the box that the National Archives is storing your case. 
of course, all of this is payable by check or money order or credit card. And when you do so, someone at the National Archives runs back to the huge stacks of boxes, pulls it out, goes to their photocopy machine, and perhaps makes a call or two to you to say, do you want such and such? Yeah? Does certified mean the package is certified or that the text is verified? When you get the text, it'll be a photocopied stack of text. And um, it's wrapped in a ribbon with a little seal, which is then signed by someone who has certified that you're getting genuine, authentic documents. So there's someone there that, for $15, does the certification. Um, it's kind of like a notary, but I think it's a particular, it's a some person from the court. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure if you can use them as if you wanted to enter them as evidence. So perhaps that's why you would want to do that. Um, these two snapshots come from two different worlds, two different ways of thinking about public access to the public record. One is, for lack of a, a better description, the internet way of thinking about things. Um, if I'm looking for something, it should be available on the web, and I should be able to find it relatively easily. Uh, the other is the sort of card catalog mentality, especially the physical card catalog mentality, um, where I need to know how to look something up, um, I need to be trained in how to use the system, and I need to physically go there to find it. Um, you know, you could also call it the difference between Google ability and an expert system. Uh, you go to Google, Google tries to figure out what you're looking for, tries to give you relevant results as quickly as possible versus expert system that requires you to know how to use it. Um, and ultimately, and this will be the recurring theme as we talk about it today, we think it's a difference between a focus on public access and clerical efficiency. And you could design a system which optimizes for either of these. Um, and uh, we will contend that the uh, federal court document access system optimizes for the latter. And it does a very good job optimizing for the latter, uh, but at the loss of the former. And uh, to give you a little bit more flavor in terms of the theme of what it means to welcome the internet into the court, Shubham is going to talk very briefly about a case he worked on last semester uh, with uh, Charlie Nesson at the Berkman Center. And we'll do awkward transfer. <laughs> OK, uh, so here's the case. It's Sony BMG versus Joel Tenenbaum. But it might be more familiar to all of you as one of the hundreds of RIAA cases that have been lodged throughout the country against users of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing programs. Uh, this case is a little bit unique in that the defendant, Joel, uh, is being represented by a Harvard Law School professor and uh, Professor Nesson, as Steve mentioned. And Professor Nesson has taken the position that because this case is in so many ways about the internet, it should be embraced by the internet. And so he's, to that end, he's filed this motion with the court uh, requesting that the internet be admitted in, into the courtroom. And uh, basically, in, in the way that the Coleman Franken trial is being webcast and, and truly being transformed into a public good. Um, the, the judge, Nancy Gertner, who sits in, in Boston, actually granted the motion. It's, that's unique. Uh, it's, it's very rare in federal courts to allow cameras in the courtroom. The administrative organs of the judiciary have made it pretty clear that they frown upon that. Um, but this particular judge has been on the forefront of trying to embrace the internet. She blogs. She's testified on the issue on Capitol Hill. Uh, so it, it's pretty unique. The recording industry has actually appealed this, and the appeal is pending right now. Uh, just to give you a flavor of some of the philosophical arguments here, one of, one of their main uh, philosophical arguments is that they're, they're fearing remix. They're worried that uh, opponents of their litigation campaign or some more progressive groups or the copy left movement are going to take these trial proceedings and slice them and dice them and Photoshop them and, and distort the law and distort their position and really turn the tide of public opinion against them. Um, and it's a concern that other people share, this idea that in the rush to just throw things on the internet, are we sacrificing privacy? Are we giving people the opportunity to distort things? And, and Steve is going to touch on some of those concerns uh, a, little bit, a little bit later. Uh, but Anyways, stay tuned because the appeals decision should be coming out in the next month or so. Has it been orally argued? The, the motion at the trial court level, the motion was argued orally. And it's not clear right now whether there will be an oral argument at the appeals level, as, as far as I know. Does, does this delay the works while this debate about whether or not to have it yes. be on the internet? Yes, it's been delayed by a month because of, because of this back and forth. And an interesting note with respect to the, the oral arguments is that um, the First Circuit 
is one of several courts which record and uh, publish oral arguments as audio files, as MP3s. You can actually subscribe to them as a podcast. Um, uh, so perhaps ironically, this just occurred to me the other day, but perhaps ironically, their arguments about not wanting to be broadcast on the web and remixed will in fact be broadcast on the web to be potentially remixed. But in any event, that's, um, that's a, a side note. Um, so uh, as, we, as we delve into the specific machine, mach federal machinery for making or not making these opinions available, um, we wanted to set forth a, a possible goal. And uh, simply stated, um, our policy position is that we should make the law as freely and as easily accessible to the public, specifically, as possible. And you might ask, well, it's hard to disagree with that. Um, but uh, we'll lay out a, a few reasons why the system has evolved in a different direction. Uh, and the principles motivating us here um, will probably be familiar to some in the room. Um, we've uh, essentially stolen the first four from a presentation and paper that James Grimmelman did and presented at CITP earlier, talking about uh, reasons why free, easy, open access should be important. Um, it's central to democracy. We can't be a nation of uh, secret law. Uh, it's central to fairness and uh, maintaining um, a right to due process, uh, that you know the law beforehand. Uh, it's necessary to judicial consistency and precedent. You may be able to justify any of any of uh, any number of decisions, but um, if you choose arbitrarily between them, you have chaos. Uh, it's important for equality, so that those uh, the, the the folks who that so that everyone can have um, access to uh, the same set of law and the ability to defend themselves, not just those who can afford wax. Uh, Wexis. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, and the fifth is really a riff on a paper that I'm sure most of you are familiar with because several of you wrote it. Um, this notion that um, it, uh, it opens, uh, free access opens up space for third party innovation, which has the potential uh, to uh, allow for all sorts of dynamic new ways of accessing um, uh, and remixing and understanding and finding what's important to you. Um, uh, and I should note, actually, uh, uh, that there's uh, another paper on the subject of PACER at this, this particular junction, which is a worthwhile read by Peter Martin called uh, Online Access to Court Records from Documents to Data, Particulars to Patterns, um, where he talks about these different usage habits as well. PACER is? Uh, PACER is. I was about to explain that. So uh, PACER is a, uh, uh, stands for Public Access to court electronic records. It is a technology infrastructure built by the federal court system uh, to allow the public, including attorneys and businesses, um, but also Joe Blow, um, uh, full electronic access to all court records. That's opinions, that's evidence, that's briefs, that's motions, uh, that's the docket. Um, uh, and it emerged in the 80s originally as a dial-up service, charging you a certain amount per minute you connected. Eventually they said, hey, this web thing is pretty cool. We should probably make it available on the web. And they began to do so. Um, but the structure of US federal districts uh, is directly reflected in the technological structure of PACER. And I'll show you PACER in action in just a minute. Um, but to give you a sense for it, all the red dots are different federal districts. And uh, each represents uh, a federal district court. Actually, there are about twice as many courts because there are also bankruptcy courts. Um, and then the black dots are circuit courts, which use a slightly different flavor of PACER. Uh, and the way that PACER is implemented is that the administrative office of the courts uh, um, uh, develops a set of software, a web application, essentially, which any of these courts can implement and do choose to implement. Uh, at this point, they're all implementing it. Um, and they make individual decisions about exactly how they're going to implement it um, and policies around running it. And they all run it themselves. And so we have over 100, uh, probably almost 200 versions of PACER out there running. And you can go to any given one of them. If you went to one, like for the Southern District of California, uh, it might look like this. Uh, you go to the, 
the page. It kind of looks like a web page out of the late 90s for good reason. It was initially developed starting around that time. Um, uh, they notify you that the facility is for official court business only. Activity to and from this site is logged. Don't do anything um, untoward. Uh, and uh, they also let you know that um, you can submit your orders to chambers in Microsoft Word format. You can stop using WordPerfect. You can safely delete that from your computer now. Um, but let's, let's go to a Pacer login, and I'll show you what the experience is like. This is actually going to, um, this is actually going to Massachusetts, specifically. Um, you'll note that in order to get access to Pacer, I first need to log in. Um, I'm reminded that this is a restricted website for official court business, even though it's the uh, public access to court electronic records. I log in. Oh, by the way, how did I get this login? Well, I, gave the, I had to give them my credit card number and a bunch of information about myself so that they could bill me um, for various actions I might do. We'll see shortly. So let's say we want to look up litigation related to this RIAA trial. Um, and we happen to, as a citizen, know enough to know that it's in Massachusetts District Court, although in reality there are proceedings in Rhode Island and I think at least uh, in Pennsylvania or something like that. But let's say we, for whatever reason, we know that we have to go here. Um, so we go to Massachusetts District Court. If we wanted to find the case, we would click on the query button um, and we're presented with this tool. So who can tell me how we would get access to this case? Does anyone know the case number? Uh, you we displayed it, didn't you? you? I'm sorry? You displayed it a few slides ago. I did display it a few slides ago, but that's because he was a, that's, so we that assumes been. that you're a lawyer that has access to the motion and you understand what a case number right. is. But right. yes, indeed. Business name, maybe? Business name, all right. So let's do business name. Let's try RIAA. Run query. All right, no person found. Um, but we did get a nice uh, receipt charging us eight cents for the search. <laughs> uh, one billable page, a, a page that says um, no person's found. So, all right, RIAA doesn't work. Um, so, we, but we know that the other party's name is Tenenbaum. So let's search for Joel Tenenbaum. All right, so we found some parties. It charges another eight cents to list the parties, but at least we're getting closer. Okay, so Tenenbaum, and his name is Joel, so if we go to Joel Tenenbaum, all right, uh, we charge us another eight cents because there's more than one case associated with Joel Tenenbaum. I'm sorry? Poor guy. Poor guy, yeah. He's really getting hit. Um, all right, and Sony BMG versus Tenenbaum, that looks the most promising. So let's look at that. Um, although the last filing was uh, it was in November, uh, so that's not very promising. Um, so your reasoning is that you know that there's been filings since then, and so this can't be the correct one. That's right. The other, the other thing is it was it's closed. closed. Uh, yum. <laughs> so uh, the reality is what we're looking for is actually this case. Um, and it doesn't have Joel's name in it because, in fact, it's a consolidated case, and Joel's case was consolidated into it. So. In any event, we're getting closer, um, and uh, so if we want, we would have, we could have fussed around through those documents and eventually found at the end one that consolidated the case. Or yeah, that's right. You could have that. You could have gone to that case, clicked on docket report, which I'm going to do for the proper case, and you'll see what you get. And um, yes, you probably so could have eventually found our way. You might have eventually found it, and the way to do it would probably be to. Um, look at the docket report. In this case, because it's a consolidated case, it's, it's got a whole bunch of other cases at the top, and it's um, very, very, very long. Uh, whatever it is, it's cutting me off. Um, so, yes, the docket report sort of, it's, it tells us everything that's happened in the case. So that's probably where you would go. So in the case of this docket report, it's extremely long. Uh, and at the bottom, we get another receipt. Uh, billable pages cost $2.40. It actually cuts off at 30 pages. This is more than whatever they think 30 pages is. Um, but they've been so nice as to cut it off after 
uh, $2.40. Um, and then we could look through here to find what we're finding. And if we looked at that other case, we would probably have eventually found a motion that told us, or an order that told us it went over here. So I know some cases of districts, or some districts have stopped charging for things like docket reports and just searches. And yes, so we'll talk about that briefly. There's, um, I'll talk I about it. I was thankful, but. Yes, yeah, I will talk about that. So there are a few select things where they have removed charges. Okay. Not docket report, not searching on page, or et cetera, but there are some limited cases. So in any event, that gives you a sense of PACER and how it works and some of the rights that we may have. Um, and Shubham, you're going to talk about the next part. Could you also then go to the appellate division and find out when your oral argument is going to be? Or is that a different You could do it for the page. Then. You'd have to go to the First Circuit. Yes, you'd have to go to the First Circuit. And it so happens that the First Circuit is using PACER now although they use a different pacer, which as far as I can tell is built on different technology. Um, but yes, the first thing that you could. Okay, so reactions to pacer. So you've probably already sensed what some of uh, our reactions are to pacer just from, from that little demo. In general, a lot, of, a lot of people appreciate it, mainly because it's, it's obviously much more efficient than the hard copy system that preceded it. I mean, attorneys who are used to practicing before are used to sort of last minute rush trips to the courthouse holding the document or fidgeting with copy machines and things like that. But there are some activists who are trying to quote unquote liberate the court documents from, from the PACER system. And their main gripes come in two buckets, the functional limitations and the fees. Um, this is a little icon of one particular activist, Carl Malamud, and his efforts. He started a site where you can recycle your PACER documents. He's telling everyone in the public and attorneys that anytime you get anything off of PACER, go to the website, drag it into that bin, and that way uh, anyone else who needs that, web that document in the future can go to his site, get it for free, and get it with uh, maybe a little bit better user interface. Um, so now what, what we're going to do is drill down a little bit on these functional limitations and the fees. And we're going to do that in, uh, in order to put some legal context to it. We're going to talk about them uh, relative to the E-Government Act of 2002. Um, basically, this was a piece of legislation uh, which set forth various uh, inter internet access requirements for federal agencies and the judiciary. The main goals were to just basically br help bring the government into the internet age. And it's probably important to note that we're not discussing this relative to the E-Government Act because this particular act represents everything that internet access to the courts should be or could be. But at the very least, it's it's a vision that was deliberated and considered and passed by Congress. So it's, if nothing else, just a minimum benchmark that, that we can measure uh, PACER against. And there were obviously a lot of purposes to this act, but if you look through the legislative history and the conference reports and the s speeches that were given on the floor of Congress, there definitely was a strong undercurrent of, of public access, that the purpose of this bill was to uh, improve citizen participation, transparency and accountability, uh, to create a citizen-oriented government. So this was a strong thrust of the bill, and we're going to focus on the requirements that are particular to the judiciary. There was one particular section, section 205 of the bill. And uh, there were a number of requirements, but you can sort of distill the main requirements into three, uh, three main points. First of all, access. They were supposed to provide access to the kinds of administrative things that you'd expect on a court's website, just like if you went to a company's website, the, you know, the contact information, th things like that. Uh, also, the substance of all written opinions issued by the court in a text searchable format. So judges in, in cases issue all kinds of orders and rulings, and some of them are ministerial and administrative. Some of them are substantive. They actually interpret the law, and they tell you what the orders and rulings are. And for those more substantive documents, they were supposed to be made available in a text searchable format. With regard to fees, uh, the E-Government Act changed the law by saying that courts are only allowed to charge internet access fees to the extent necessary. Before, they were allowed to charge whatever they thought was reasonable, and this limited their discretion to do so. And then uh, certain steps to protect uh, the privacy of the, of, of the documents and sensitive information that might be disclosed during uh, litigation. So, the purpose of this, of this particular section was stated in the Senate report that accompanied the bill, which was to provide the public with access to help them research case law, 
and uh, provide them with access to the court system. So again, this undercurrent of public access to the courts. So let's start with that first requirement that I talked about, the text searchable uh, directive about, about the written opinions. So the requirement was to provide access to these written opinions in a text searchable format. And there was no specific legislative intent where Congress sort of said, this is what we mean by this. But one would presume that this was for the goal of facilitating, facilitating legal research. That was one of the stated goals of the bill. And the common sense interpretation is, well, why would you make a document text searchable so people can find it, so people can run a search through some kind of search engine like Google and find the document? Um, so the, the, the administrative organ of the judiciary sort of hemmed and hawed, and their committee is hemmed and hawed about how to interpret this requirement. Uh, you know, if we interpret it this way, then it might be harder to implement. It might be easier to implement if we interpret it this other way. Ultimately, they settled on this particular interpretation which basically says that the PACER system that Steve demoed for you earlier satisfies this text searchable requirement because it allows for searching within a document. I found this statement to be a little cryptic because what does it mean to be able to search within a document? To me, that just means you can open up the document and do control F and find a word in it. But if you've already been able to access the document, you know, being able to do control F and find a word doesn't help you unless there's sort of a search engine built around it that can search through all of the text of all these different documents and help you find uh, doc documents of interest. So because of this, a lot of courts have just implemented the PACER system and left it at that. A few have set up separate keyword searchable databases where you can do sort of Google searching kind of thing. Um, but, but most haven't. And, and if you remember, this was the search interface that Steve was messing around with before. And there's really no way to do any kind of keyword searching through the text of these documents. So if you want to find something about gay marriage, there's nowhere for you to just type in gay marriage and see what pops up. There's a couple other important functional limitations of PACER. Uh, first is that all the courts keep their documents firewalled. So Google can't access these. Uh, there's just no way to jump on Google and, and, and get at these, at these court documents. And as Steve also mentioned, that there, uh, there's each court implements PACER itself. So there's no coordination. If you want to, yes? So when you say um, firewalls, you mean it blocks access to Google's search? Yes. Bots? Yeah. yeah. If Google had a login, yeah, they could, they could purchase all these documents and get them all. And, and that's what Wesson and Lexis do. And it's kind of led to a little bit of uh, a monopoly or oligopoly structure to, to the in, in this whole market. But if Google, if Google applied for a login, would they, would they be denied or just they would have to pay? No, anyone money? can get a login. Any, any of us could, could, could get a login. And I guess the question would be if, if they actually got a login and bought all the documents and started giving them over for free, how would the ju judiciary react to that? I guess I'm not, I'm not sure if there's Steve no might have. On the right? yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's certainly not copyright protected or anything yeah. like that. I mean, it seems like the problem is that the documents just aren't crawlable. I mean, the document's probably stored in some database, and then you have to do a search to find, or some query to find that particular document, but you can't use Google's existing, you know, web crawling, um, you know, yeah. spider to just, you know, index everything. Often they're not even OCR, so. Right. So what, what's the native format that the courts usually get the documents in? Is it just a PDF? Is it? Yeah, people, well, anything? these days people usually submit it in PDF, and, and there's a little bit of a dichotomy. Steve, you can jump in if you want, but, but some people sur uh, submit a PDF that actually has a text layer. Some people submit a PDF that's basically an image, if, if you know what I mean. Um, so and, and their transition part, go ahead. Oh, sorry, each court needs to OCR the document, basically. To yeah, I think, I, mean, I think they're encouraging the parties to use OCR when they're submitting the documents in the first instance. Uh, and if, if that's not the case, I think some courts might, might run it through an OCR. Or, or, or actually, if, if, they get, if they get just a scanned image, I think that that's just what they use. Yeah, that's what they use. Uh, and the, the only difference is with respect to opinions and given the fact that they've accepted this mandate for opinions to be text searchable and they consider that requires it to have a text layer in it, now all or almost all opinions are accessible in that fashion, with the exception of one court, but I'll mention that later. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so quickly, and, and you can obviously understand the limitation of having to search each site separately. If you want to do legal research across the country on an issue like gay marriage or something, you have to go to every single district court. That's not particularly feasible. And obviously, I've, I've sort of hinted at, at what we think a simple way forward is. And this is the paper that, that Steve alluded to earlier. Go ahead. How much uniformity is there in terms of interface? Like, if I go into one page system and then go to the page system for another court, will I be able to fairly easily figure out the new one? Or is it 
it's, I mean, the, the PACER system itself is pretty much kind of a standard platform that the, that the courts have implemented. But yeah. each, there each are some odd discrepancies yeah. because they have some latitude to change settings. But for the most part, it's a consistent interface within PACER. That's like an underlying piece of software. That has yes. Well, okay. typically the splash pages are really different. You have to find the one little place to click on to get to the Yeah, here, here's an example. I mean, here's three different yeah. splash pages, you know, three different court websites. And how to get to PACER in the first place isn't always that easy. It's just you have to muck around with it a little bit. Um, and so one prescription for, for all of those shortcomings is just remove the documents from their firewalls and let private parties take over. Uh, a couple examples of where this has been successful. Uh, the PTO made a lot of patent documents public, part of the public domain and, and Google implemented a patent search tool. Uh, here's another example, fedspending.org. This relates to uh, the piece of legislation that President Obama was touting on the campaign trail, the Google for Government where Congress has to disclose or, or provide a website that discloses how it's spending money. And uh, the, the government was sort of having trouble getting in a web implementation of this program up. And some nonprofit uh, in, in, in the private sector came up with a working website. And, and the government sort of admitted defeat and, and purchased their system. And now that's what they're using. So just examples of how the, the private sector can really step in. And as long as the government makes the underlying documents available, uh, that's, that's really that's really all they need. And so in, in addition to the functional limitations, there's the complaints about the fees. And S Steve, I think, is going to talk a little bit about that. So uh, Shubham mentioned the, the uh, uh, statutory change in the E-Government Act, changing the language to be able to chart so that the judiciary is able to charge only to the extent necessary. Now, of course, that still leaves some amount of ambiguity. Uh, so one might look to that same Senate report to get a better sense of what the legislative intent was. Um, and in that report, uh, the Senate observes that their, uh, their purpose is that this information become as freely available to the greatest extent possible. Um, and observes that uh, currently the, the system, the, the situation that they're seeking to rectify is that PACER us users are charged fees that are higher than the marginal cost of dissemina disseminating the information. So it's a reasonable interpretation that what they meant was don't charge anything more than the marginal cost of making this available to the public. Well, I mean, do we know that? I mean, do they have like monkeys doing this or something that could be quite expensive? Uh, that's a good question. So. Uh, the judiciary releases its own annual report reporting on expenditures and income related to information technology. And um, this is from the uh, 2000, well, it's the report on the year 2006, came out in 2007. Um, so the important line items are, for example, the electronic public access program. That would be the clearest one, and that refers explicitly to PACER. They spent uh, $16 million, uh, according to their own records, on that or sorry, 11.6. Uh, and there's another related line item uh, for court administration case management systems, um, which we might reasonably include, or include part of that at least, in our total if we wanted to know how much they actually spend on PACER. Um, it gets a little bit complicated because the system for PACER is essentially the same technology as the system for attorney filings, which falls under uh, court administration case management. Um, so uh, y y one could reasonably include at least some of that um, in the cost. So uh, in total, we might, uh, we might assume that the, you know, they're reaching at most uh, $30 million a year for it. They also note elsewhere that in the course of one year for the Pacer Service Center, they spent $2.9 million. This is basically the people in San Antonio that answer the phone when you don't understand how Pacer works or um, help you with other uh, service issues. Um, and then under revenue, uh, they note that uh, they made $62.3 million uh, in fee collections for electronic public access. Uh, notably, uh, more than twice what, in our most generous estimate, we would say that PACER costs. Is this added up across all the districts? Is there this is... Does the money go to the central PACER? System? Well, this is, so this is the money, this is the income into the... Uh, it's a good question if there's any additional because money that goes to the districts. Is, but the district could be losing money while another one is making huge profits. Is that possible? 
I think that's probably possible. I don't know how they allocate the cost district to district, but this is all inclusive of everything, all of the income that came into on the federal level into the uh, administrative office and all the money that went out, at least. Um, and the other line, which we didn't highlight here, but I, I'll refer to briefly later, is a, a revenue line item for deposits from salaries and expenses account. That's essentially Congress outlays, which was $260 million. Uh, and I uh, essentially already observed this. It, it appears that their expenses are less than half of their income, at least for that year. Uh, and in their report that year, uh, uh, they reported back to the Judicial Conference, which is essentially the, the larger body within the judiciary that makes these decisions, that they had significant accumulated un, uh, a significant accumulation of unobligated balances. They had made a bunch of money and they didn't know what to do with it. Um, and actually the way that the, uh, joint, uh, the Judiciary and Information Technology Fund works, they can carry money forward year to year. So they, can, they built up a sort of war chest. What is the last Oh, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that. Expanded. Yes, a multi-part strategy to reduce future unobligated balances, including expanding the use of electronic public access funds. They were finding other stuff to spend it on. So, wait. So, reduce future. So they're reducing any problem. Ah. So they're spending out of all of these this extra money they have. They're going to reduce the surplus by finding unrelated things to buy. Yes, but they have to be related to IT at least, um, because it's coming out of this IT fund, which by Congress standards, um, they say they have to spend on IT. I don't know if that includes like Blackberries for judges, um, but IT related. Um, we'll note briefly, there is a mechanism for requesting fee exemptions from PACER. Uh, if you are a pro bono attorney, or if you uh, are representing yourself, or you're a nonprofit, you can ask PACER, or more specifically, you can ask a particular district court to give you a fee exemption. You fill out this form and send it, and then they reply either yes or no. Uh, sometimes they reply yes, sometimes they re reply no. Uh, the judicial conference uh, told judges that exemption should be granted as the exception, not the rule. Um, and in, this, in that case, you can get PACER access without having to pay. So individual cases, we're talking on the order of a few dollars per, like you have to like $5. No, you get you can get an exemption. Well, <laughs> sort of. You get an exem exemption for a particular court, but you have to tell them what, yeah, what court and what case, or at the very least, what purpose. Does it have case specifically? Yeah, you, there's a there's a line where you tell okay. them what cases. So you could say, I want to get all the cases, and then they probably wouldn't give you access. In fact, I know cases of that happening. But yes, uh, presumably you'd have to do it over and over. Um, free written opinion. So uh, there are some encouraging developments. Uh, well, moderately encouraging developments. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the courts interpreted parts of the e-government act to instruct them that they should be starting to provide access to opinions, not all of the other documents or the docket report, but at least opinions uh, for free. Uh, it's hard to read the read exactly where in the act this is specified. But in any event, it's great that they think that they need to provide opinions for free. Um, and in order to implement this, they added a function where on the PACER site, you can get a report of all opinions from a particular court. And then you can download those specific opinions free of charge. Um, now, the way that it works is that someone from a court, from the individual court, when they're filing the opinion, has to mark it as a written opinion in order for it to show up in this report. There's no sort of automated system for figuring out what's an opinion. Um, and as you might expect, across all of these different courts, all of the different people doing it, and the somewhat vague guidelines that the uh, administrative office gave them, I believe it was something like um, a document that expresses uh, what the, the opinion of the court or something like that. Um, uh, they spent a lot of time in committee figuring out the exact language, but ultimately it is somewhat up to the discretion. So you have somewhat inconsistent results. Um, so I've done, I'm almost finished, still tweaking the numbers on an audit of all documents for 2008, all opinions for 2008, 
and whether or not they're available in the free opinion report. And uh, I'm using as my baseline anything that's in Westlaw, uh, which includes both technically reported and technically not reported uh, uh, opinions. There's no real distinction anymore, but it used to matter. Um, and then matching that against the free opinion reports. And my methodology actually currently will allow for some overcounting in some cases um, uh, if uh, documents from a, well, anyway, sometimes it overcounts and I'm trying to make sure that it doesn't undercount. The, the net result is here are a few sample numbers of the worst defenders. Um, so the top would be Alabama, Northern District of Alabama, for example, none of the opinions from the whole year of 2008 were available on PACER. The same thing with uh, Southern District of Iowa, uh, New Mexico, uh, the Nor Northern Marina Islands. Um, uh, and then uh, we have a few scattered here and there. Um, this, this is about a third, uh, or yeah, this is about a third of them. The other two thirds have the majority of the opinions available. Um, but uh, whether or not they're comprehensively posting the opinions is perhaps beyond, uh, is perhaps not the point. The point is once you leave it up to the discretion of all of these individual humans about what they make available, whether or not you set that as opinions or you set that as all court documents or what, you're going to have inconsistency and the inability to get a full comprehensive set. Oh, and sorry, and I'll say one more thing. Ultimately, when all is said and done, the numbers indicate that about one in five opinions are not available as part of the free opinion report. That's fascinating. Um, did you have to negotiate some sort of special access with West to be able to do this? No, I'm, I'm doing academic research, well, and I'm at a law school. Are you using an API system? Because if you're, are you just comparing one off? Because it, it's, it's no, I had, to do, I had to do like 100 different West queries and then download the results and then parse the results and parse the case numbers and then do a regular expression on my downloads of everything from PACER. Oh, they're also going to lock you out if you look like you're doing certain kinds of stuff. Which is they haven't locked me out yet. I think I've got a reasonable Great. defense. I am doing educational research. Yeah. So <laughs> Now, if I posted all their stuff online, that would be a different issue, but then I would have to find James Grimmelman to defend me. Um, there are other small functional issues that contribute to this fee problem, things like if you look at that big long Docker report I showed you and you go to look at one of the particular documents and you hit the back button, it reloads the page and charges you another $2.40. It's a very simple technical fix. It's a cache header that they send to you that they probably shouldn't be sending to your browser. But in any event, it contributes to the overall problem. Ultimately, I think this is a usability problem. Those of you who are computer scientists or human computer interaction folks uh, will understand this and have read this book, I'm sure. It's a, it's a canon of human computer interaction, uh, the, design of, the design of everyday things by Don Norman. Um, the principles behind user-centered design start with the user and start with identifying who the relevant user is. In our case, and in the case of the language of Congress, the relevant user is the public. It's not necessarily attorney practitioners, although it's intended to serve them as well. It's not the business users that contribute the bulk majority of the PACER revenues um, because West and Lexus download everything and pay millions of dollars in fees a year. Um, it's the users. And here, I, I thought there was a great quote from the Peter Martin PACER article. Uh, he says, uh, PACER's financial dependence on the market value of court records has had, uh, has had an effect on system design. So PACER's financial dependence on Westlaw, and Choice Point, and all of these other uh, agencies that download everything. He says, uh, features with reasonable prospect of furthering the foundational goals of transparency, judicial accountability, public education, and informed debate on important matters of policy have been ignored or rejected. Otherwise beneficial arrangements that might have threatened the willingness of the commercial sector to pay PACER fees have not been treated as realistic options. Um, so ultimately, I think it comes down to a user issue. And uh, because of the fees coming in and because of where PACER has come from uh, as initially primarily a, an internal tool for practitioners, they come to it with certain assumptions about who the users are. And I think that hinders their decision-making process. So very briefly, um, a couple of the big barriers to getting this stuff opened up. Uh, one is uh, privacy and one is cost. On the privacy side, this is a huge and legitimate concern. Um, 
we have issues like um, uh, poor redact redaction of personal or proprietary business information and the unintended consequences that has on the people who are mentioned in those documents. Obviously, court records have a lot of personal data in them. Um, I mean, you can start with divorce proceedings, um, but you can also have companies like um, GE, in this case, uh, with proprietary information or personal information about their employees, um, which, when not properly redacted from an electronic document, um, can be very damaging and can potentially live on Google forever. Um, in, this, in the case of G, the GE example, which happened in, I think, last year, in 2008, uh, they redacted the PDFs improperly, of course, by drawing black boxes over the text. And when you open the PDF, you could just select the text, copy it, and paste it back into a text editor, and there was the text. Um, Oh, great. <laughs> well, even easier. Um, and I'm sure that if Google were doing the automatic conversion to HTML for you, it would be right there as well, and all very Googleable. Um, so this is an issue. And in fact, one of the courts, the Delaware, uh, District Court of Delaware, has now, for I think four years in a row, um, deferred compliance with their understanding of the e-government act. What does that mean? They have told Congress. Uh, that they're not going to comply with the e-government act's requirements, which they interpret to be publishing things in text searchable format. Um, and in fact, there is a loophole. They're allowed to defer if they want to, according to the act. Kind of a bizarre thing. Congress says, you have to do this, but if you don't, you have to at least tell us you're not going to do it. Um, they've deferred compliance. And the reason that they've given year after year is we're worried that we won't be able to adequately redact things from court documents. And so we're going to post the images instead of the textual documents. No difference in the actual content if you're reading it, but just in the searchability. Yeah? How much higher is the privacy bar in terms of electronic access versus paper access to you know, existing? So that's a, that's a fundamental question. Um, we have guidelines, and there are court rules and guidelines around what must be redacted. And in fact, often when you find uh, stuff in these documents, that you would object to, it's because some lawyer or some judge, in many cases, has broken the rules. Um, Actually, the I, I the policy, in, in yeah. Every, in every courthouse in New Jersey, Choice Point has staff people with workstations in the basement with photos of their kids, and they're pulling out box after box uh, to be scanned uh, in a little portable scanner. So I don't think the bar is very high at all. Yeah. <laughs> and th there may be. Part of this is about the line between, um, uh, and Peter, uh, Peter Wynn speaks about this really well in a paper that I don't know if it's published yet or not, but it's, it'll be fantastic when it comes out. Uh, he talks about the difference between a practical, uh, practical obscurity um, and, and uh, I don't know, absolute real obscurity. I'm not, but, but historically, there has been practical obscurity of court records. There's been no easy way to search for everything talking about me in court documents. And that has meant that the courts have, haven't had to develop a richer set of rules around this stuff. Um, but the reality is that that practical obscurity goes away in a completely searchable environment. Uh, and often, that is part of the argument that's standing in the way of free access. Um, the argument is, well, if we put it behind a paywall, or if we don't make it fully text searchable, then we won't have to confront these larger questions around, well, what should the bar be for privacy? So no doubt there should be privacy protections. The question is, do we restrict access as an excuse? Um, uh, and cost, we've, I've already discussed cost a lot. Um, but you can get a sense, um, this is their forward going projections about how much um, public access and the court administration line item in general will cost. Uh, and for 2008, uh, they were predicting an almost doubling of what we saw in 2006. So clearly, it was ongoing costly. Uh, on the other hand, you might make arguments about how the system could be run in another way that's more cost efficient. You make arguments that all of the record keeping around billing would actually, if you got rid of it, would get rid of some of the cost, ironically. Um, but in any event, cost is huge. And the, the courts have a perception that Congress is not going to give them funding to run this system. So the only way the system exists at all is by charging user fees. Um, 
And I'll end on a, a, a little note of hope. There are opportunities for reforming the system right now. Um, the first is uh, a general sentiment in Washington around the change of administration, um, around the, um, the memos that Obama has released about government transparency. There's a great deal of discussion. And it may be a good moment to, th so that we can seize that momentum and extend that to the judiciary as well. But part of the challenge will be the judiciary does not fall directly underneath the executive branch, of course. That's why we have separation of powers. And the president can't just issue an executive order saying, change it to work such and such way. Uh, to the extent that Congress has power, and this relates to the second point, um, they have the power of the purse. And uh, they could allocate more funds, or they could threaten to cut funds that they are already planning to allocate. Um, but they can't go in there and do policy directly within the judiciary. I mean, it could certainly affect all the Article Three courts. I mean, Congress has power over that, that middle level branch. I mean, they can create the rules of evidence. They can create the. I'm pointing to my, my lawyer on the matter. Well, I guess, I mean, the response to that is they, to some extent, already tried. I think with the e government act, it seemed like there were some clear things that they were trying to get accomplished, which, at least under our reading, weren't done. But they, they weren't but, effective. Well, well, I mean, okay, Congress, Congress can keep passing legislation till they're blue in the face, but ultimately, what do they do to to make to get something to happen? And there's, you know, there's a couple ways to do it. I mean, when Congress pa passes the legislation, how do they enforce it? Well, one way is to, you know, give people the right to sue the courts based on violating it. But that's going to open a whole can of worms that Congress probably doesn't want to do. The other, the other way is to. You use the power of the purse. Say, unless you comply with these directives, we're not we're going to stop paying the bills. Um, but again, that's an ex that's kind of a trump card which they don't really want to play because it's such an extreme measure. So the question is how you know w while respecting the sovereignty of the ju judiciary as compared to the legislative branch, how you know how how does this happen? And Congress can only do so much within within reason, and I think it's more likely that that the change would actually have to come with a policy. An attitude change within the judiciary itself. That's at least my Has the opinion. Chief Justice spoken on when he gives his annual report to, to Congress on the various things? Has he spoken in, in favor of the E access? In uh, I haven't seen. I should look at the specific text. It's not one of the hot button issues. He tends to talk about things like are the judges being paid enough? Um, um, but that. That he doesn't tend to come up as much. And in fact, when the judiciary does talk about public access to electronic records, it is very self-laudatory. It uh, there's a great uh, I wish I had that uh, that quote, but there's a, a great article that they wrote in their own internal magazine, essentially talking about how revolutionary Pacer was and how amazing it was. Uh, there's a Wired article with Carl Malamud going sort of back and forth in the quotes with someone from the administrative office. And so the person from the administrative office says, PACER is the most revolutionary thing the courts have done in the past 20 years. It's amazing. Um, so I think what it ends up coming down to is a, a, a question of perception. Who are we building this for, and what should it really do? I think they deserve a whole lot of credit for building something that serves lawyers and practitioners much, much better than it did before. Um, but it's about resetting those expectations. And I think what Shubham was saying is sort of attitudinal change. Um, what else? Should, oh, and I'll mention only very briefly. So there was a, a, an e-government reauthorization that didn't pass in the past uh, last uh, session of Congress, which uh, contains some very specific language around um, what federal agencies must do to make their sites searchable. Again, there's a question, a separation of powers question, as to whether or not that would apply to the judiciary. Um, uh, there is, as we understand it, they're working on a new PACER or a new version or a major revision of PACER based on the committee reports that are coming out. And so this might be a right moment to start that conversation. Um, and then there's direct activism, like the stuff that Carl Malamud has been doing. Um, and in fact, uh, he, so he has this recycling site. Um, he's gotten a huge quantity of PACER documents, not necessarily one-off from people going and uploading. Um, uh, but like a large percentage of what was in the database, at, at least as of a particular date. And then 
culled that and written reports and submitted them to the administrative office saying, here are the privacy violations, here are the social security numbers and medical records that should have been redacted, and you should fix this problem, but you need to remember sunlight is the best disinfectant. Uh, we need to get more people looking at this and keeping the uh, judiciary, um, uh, keeping them on track, um, rather than using practical obscurity as an excuse to um, keep it working. So with that, we'll continue the conversation, take questions if we have time. Let's um, do the Q&A salon style, which means we will adjourn upstairs two floors and get food and drink in our hands, and then have a conversational Q&A. Uh, Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.